Fallout New Vegas has a lot of melee weapons, ranging from a simple razor to a thick super sludge. Somewhere between the upper range of those two exists a weapon that I honestly haven't ever considered using, the Thermic Lance. According to the Fallout Wiki, it turns out that this weapon has the potential of being the most damaging melee weapon in the entire game. The problem? We have to get it first. Let's pull up our thigh highs, cuddle our stuffed animals, and see if you can beat Fallout New Vegas only using the Thermic Lance. Getting out of bed with two more holes than usual, I named myself Lance. If you guys had any notion that I was creative, I'm pretty sure that this took all of that away. If it didn't, the slick back hair and chops certainly did. For my special stats, I went with high endurance and luck to see if we could create a very beefy boy that could hit crits harder than I hit on femboys. Melee weapons, repair, and survival were chosen for my tag skills before going with built to destroy and skilled for my traits. We can get into why I did all of that stuff later. First, I have to pillage Doc Mitchell's house, sell as much stuff as I can to the town Scrooge, and leave the somewhat peaceful town of Good Springs. Wanting to expedite obtaining the Thermic Lance, I head through Hidden Valley, kiss everyone's favorite green giant on the lips so passionately that I get goosebumps just thinking about it, stop by the section full of subs wearing skirts, and pick up the combat armor and some chems at the right caravan. This of course allows me to talk to Venetron and Blake. I'd hoped that deep down that Vendi would already have the lance and that I could have this run done in a day, but you'll soon find out that getting the weapon itself isn't all that easy. Stepping into Freeside and completing the King's Quest, I snag up Confirmed Bachelor and Radchild, two holy grails of this run. Arcade Ganon is one of the eight companions in Fallout New Vegas, and can be recruited in several ways, including a speech skill of 75, a high reputation with the followers of the apocalypse, having less than three intelligence, or my personal favorite, flirtation. Overt flirtation will get you everywhere, you know. Armed with Confirmed Bachelor, I add him to the team before trading for medical supplies at the clinic and heading to Helios with Arcade. He's a very remarkable man, and given his sexy age of 35, I'm definitely willing to have feelings for a fictional character. Once inside, I talk with Fantastic and Ignatia before accessing the terminals, disarming some mines, taking a water break, sending power to Fremont and Westside, and talking with Ignatio. I then help a brother out by killing a worthless piece of trash so that I could obtain a cool hat and a friend should I need one in the future. This was naturally followed by heading to the nearby ghoul-infested test site. Arcade seems to do pretty good work as long as I can lure the enemies to me with my bussy, but if enemies get the chance to start wailing on him, he is about as healthy as those folks on my big fat fabulous life. I do a little bit of looting, run past some enemies, and truly appreciate how hot Arcade's face is. I'm not gay, but I would be willing to ride his face into the sunset. Unfortunately, I have to talk with Jason instead, and he sends me to the basement. Davison sends me to the nearby room, and like the rest of this playthrough so far, I just completely ignore the ghoul in the basement, that way I could just walk up to the terminal with very little resistance. This made Jason pretty happy, so to reward myself for not dying, I stopped by the devil's butthole to grab not only radiation poisoning, but the holotape on the Brotherhood of Steel Paladin. The survival we grab for a tank skill allows us to get Radchild a little sooner, and being able to regenerate 8 health a second, in exchange for 3 endurance, 2 agility, and 2 strength, is completely worth it in my experience. I love this perk so much that you'll find it mentioned in over half of my videos, and that the channel's discord has not one, but two rad child stickers. Feel free to join with the link in the description, it's a cool place to hang out with bottoms and nerds. Something that isn't as cool is the steep charge that old lady Gibson has for the parts needed for the rocket, but fortunately we were able to get the other parts for free from this rad dude. You can of course use the 5 rockets from Mick and Ralph's or Tinky's storeroom, but sometimes tradition beats logic. Whichever option you choose, returning to Chris and watching a delicious climax, quite a bit of experience is awarded to your courier. I opted to grab comprehension before once again checking Vendi. I of course had no luck. Working more on getting into Arcade's pants, I head over to the Repcon headquarters, as well as Thomas Hildren for even more brownie points. Each companion has an affinity that needs to be reached before doing their quest, so it may help for you to read up a little bit on the wiki for each trigger. Heading over to Boulder City to unlock the cons as a trading resource because they too can supposedly sell the lance, I talk with Monroe and Jessup to ease the sexual tension between the two factions. While in the area, I pop over to Hoover Dam for some sightseeing before going into No Man's Land. It's actually called No Man's Land because it is the area in war where all of the men would willingly become women so that any additional levels of the testosterone will be equalized between the two sides, thus creating a more level playing field. At Nellis, I talk with Pearl and Pete before leveling up. I do grab Super Slam, but this perk didn't proc once this entire run, so I would stay clear of it if you plan on only utilizing the lance in your own playthroughs. I always hate wasting a perk, so once I found out this, I went for a 4 mile sprint and proceeded to absolutely destroy my muscles. 
I'm pretty sure that that isn't a healthy coping mechanism. Nora is playing the same game over and over again, but hey, here we are. Where is here, you may ask? Well, the answer is once again at the King's. Here I grab Rex and take the long journey to Jacobstown. In that moment or two of silence, I was able to reach a zen style, known only as Shower Thoughts with Owl. The thought for this month is why don't people in zombie movies just wear light armor that can't be bitten through? Coming to no conclusion by my lonesome, I seek out Marcus. He appears both shocked and bamboozled, but implies that if anyone would know the answer, it would have to be Dr. Henry. Much like the usefulness of a German to French dictionary when I only speak English and three words of Spanish, Dr. Henry fails to please me even slightly. This disappoints me a great deal, so I set out once again into the waste to find the ultimate answer to my question. Old Lady Gibson, with her years of experience and well-moisturized hands, suggested that due to the lack of manufacturing existing in a post-apocalyptic world, that it would likely be impossible for every human to have access to such clothing. As I motioned to appeal the idea and present my side of the debate, she threw me a brain. Not knowing what to do with it, I played a game of hot potato and tossed it over to Dr. Henry. I figured that with his usefulness being non-existent that it would be a cakewalk, but he managed to toss it to Rex. Our fluffy and well-endowed canine companion was ill-equipped for the encounter with the lack of opposable thumbs, so he had to hang on to the brain. Unfortunately, he still couldn't talk to me. Passing the credit check, I leave Arcade outside of the tops and walk in with my metal bodyguard at my side, but that still didn't make the fight with Benny very easy. I did try this encounter previously with Arcade, but he died hilariously quick. He's a bottom for a reason. With the platinum chip now in hand, I had a talk with the Pez dispenser, grabbed a slightly less gay arcade after I had a stripper babysit him, saw the Monopoly man, appeased him by watching him play with his model robots for a solid 5 minutes, grabbed the snow globe in the cocktail lounge, and turned the rest of the men for a total of 14,000 caps. If you ever feel like walking for 30 minutes and discovering a crap ton of locations, definitely consider doing this for some easy early game caps. Something that's just as easy is jumping over to Searchlight to pass by Cottonwood Cove and see the hot solid man. I don't know why men with buzz cuts or a receding hairline really get me going, but I blame it on the fact that my uncle looked awfully similar before he went to prison. Here, the combat armor was able to protect me against all the turrets and robots, but of course I still had to rely on Rex to take down the three turrets at the end of the bunker. Arcade of course tried, but he is built for the bedroom, not the battlefield. I did grab the experience from turning in the quest for Kaiser just so I could see his attractive body one last time before talking with Vendi and Mr. House, waiting three days and doing a crap ton more trading. I saw Vendertron, Mick, and the Great Cons, but none of them had what I was truly looking for. I was getting really disappointed at this point and seriously contemplated just picking up a random weapon and changing this entire run, but I was committed at this point and couldn't give up now. I head back to the Repcon headquarters and No Man's Land for their respective holotapes, help Raquel deal with the ants, repaired the solar panels for Loyal, bought some missiles so that I could be Raquel's sugar daddy, and retrieved the bomber from the bottom of the lake with the help of Jack's rebreather. Pearl was pleased, as was Mr. House. Continuing right on with Mr. House's quest, I stop by the Emeritus, talk with Kachino, Blackmail Clandon, plant the Thermite, and watch as Rex tore apart Big Sal and Nero. I've never really used any companions for an extended period of time, but Rex actually blew me away with how effective he was. I know that for survival, Lupa's brain is typically preferred, but the damage was amazing as long as I could micromanage his health. After dealing with the Emeritus, Mr. House played with my breasts, and I began the Brotherhood of Steel segment. One of the other locations you can supposedly obtain the lance is from the Brotherhood Quartermaster, so I figured that befriending them would be a solid idea. In order to make this happen, I destroy the radio, talk with McNamara, blow up the Silver Rush, fanboy over Rex for like the 10th time this run as he takes down Simon, talk with the hardest guy I know, spend an obnoxiously long period of time accessing the terminals, and make Harden the Elder. All of this only to find out that they also don't have the lance. Since the Brotherhood didn't serve my needs, I stole all of their keycards and blew up their home. Mr. House is pleased and I grab Arcade before having a 5 minute conversation with him. Most of the time I skip all the dialogue because I've heard it dozens of times, but I tend not to skip companion dialogue and a few other characters like your mom. I hit up Dr. Henry for a booty call, but he sends me to deal with the Night Stalkers instead. Finally ready for more defense, I put together the Enclave with the help of Arcade, including Krigger, Morano, Johnson, Whitman and began the final part of Feraldoin Sang. Having a conversation with them, I revealed that we would be supporting the NCR instead of the Legion during the final battle of Vacuum Cleaners. This led Moreno to throw a fit, so I had to fight him to the death. With the power of Femboys, Anime, and Rex, he goes down and I am able to grab his armor. Since I encouraged Arcade to fight in the battle, he suits up in his favorite BDSM gear before popping into the bunker to please Daisy, his mother figure. After a vendor check and grabbing a bunch of implants, I grab another man troubled by his life choices. 
You see, one of the other places you could get the Thermic Lance, and as a matter of fact, the only way that I've ever found them naturally, is by the ever-common Legion Assassin parties. Unfortunately, for an unprepared player to take down one of these parties on very hard and hardcore, they have to be willing to lose everything. And at this point, I was. Shortly after finding a party outside of Ranger Station Charlie, both Boone and Rex took their last breath. I had plenty enough Kims, armor, and healing from Radchild to survive just about anything shy of a Deathclaw, but what I didn't have was damage. Fortunately, the Ranger I had called in from the radio and an additional Ranger that was stationed at Charlie were tough enough to take the Centurion down, and I was beyond excited to finally obtain the weapon that I would be using for this run. After taking a break, I helped Ranger Grant secure the President by killing the Assassin in the tower as well as the Engineer. Despite having been relatively kind to the NCR up until this point, they did manage to get in the way at the substation and were my first victims of mass casualty. They were quickly followed by another Legion death squad, some random raiders, and the Legion infested town of Nipton. It did well, but I wasn't satisfied with just returning to Mr. House and ending the game. But I will tell you what does satisfy me. I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and nervousness as I walked into the gym. We had agreed to meet here for our first date and I couldn't have asked for a better location. The moment I laid eyes on her, I knew it was going to be a memorable day. She stood there, radiating confidence and beauty. Her athletic figure showcased her dedication to fitness, and her bright smile added a touch of warmth to the room. I greeted her with a nervous grin, trying my best to hide my admiration. We decided to kick off our date with a game of pickleball. As we stepped onto the court, I couldn't help but feel a surge of competitiveness. It was clear that she was no stranger to physical activity, and I didn't want to be left in the dust. We rallied back and forth, exchanging shots with growing intensity. The sweat began to trickle down my forehead, but it was exhilarating. It felt like we were dancing, our movements in perfect sync. After an intense match, we called it a tie, both of us panting for breath. The shared sense of achievement brought us closer together. We decided to take a break and replenish our energy with refreshing fruit smoothies. Sitting on a bench, we sipped our drinks, enjoying the coolness against our parched throats. As we chatted, I found myself captivated by her stories. She shared her love for staying active and her dedication to maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Her passion was infectious, and it made me want to push my own boundaries. After our break in a sadly lonely shower, she suggested that we head back to her place to watch a movie. It sounded like the perfect way to continue our date. Walking into her cozy living room, I couldn't help but admire the tasteful decor and the pictures of her engaging in various fitness activities. We settled onto the couch, a comfortable silence filling the air. She turned on the TV and we snuggled closer as the movie began. As the plot unfolded, I occasionally stole glances at her, marveling at her beauty even in the dim light. The movie itself was secondary to the feeling of being so close to her, especially when we just laughed at how terrible the movie was. The hours passed by effortlessly, and the movie credits rolled. We sat there, still lost in each other's company. I couldn't have asked for a more enjoyable and engaging first date. It felt like we had connected on multiple levels, both physically and emotionally. As the night drew to a close, I reluctantly stood up, knowing that it was time to say goodbye. We exchanged lingering glances, each of us holding a desire for one another. A fire, if you will. Love is a flame that burns brightly inside. So much, in fact, that it can burn brighter than the fire around me. I know I skipped over Old World Blues, but honestly, the DLC is a combat slog when you take away the dialogue and quirky personalities, and nothing interesting happened. I did learn that both the durability and damage of the lance wasn't as great as what I had hoped, but that first part there could be due to built to destroy, and I figured that by gaining more levels and trying it out on some enemies that aren't notoriously known for being super tanky would be a good idea. That of course leads me to Honest Hearts. This DLC is by far the easiest to complete as it contains lightly armored enemies and simple fetch quests. Because of that and my intention to narrate Lonesome Road, I've got another story for you, a fable about honesty. Once upon a time in a small village nestled at the base of a majestic mountain range, there lived a young boy named Adam. Adam was known for his mischievous nature and his knack for spinning tales that often strayed far from the truth. His vivid imagination could weave the most enchanting stories, but they often led him into trouble. One sunny morning while the village was bustling with its daily activities, Adam stumbled upon a mysterious looking stone in the nearby woods. It shimmered with a magical glow, captivating his curious mind. 
Excited by the possibilities, he clutched the stone tightly in his hand and pondered over what he desired most. Adam's heart fluttered with a mischievous idea. He wished for the ability to speak only lies. Little did he know that his wish would soon teach him a valuable lesson about honesty and truthfulness. As the sun began to set, Adam returned to the village, unaware that the enchantment had befallen him. He went about his daily routine, but his newfound ability began to wreak havoc. His lies grew wider, and he would often spin tales to impress his friends and family. Soon the villagers grew weary of Adam's deceitful stories. They could no longer trust his words and began to distance themselves from him. Even his closest friends became skeptical of his tales. Adam's heart sank, realizing the consequences of his actions. He had pushed everyone away with his web of lies, leaving him feeling isolated and remorseful. One evening, as Adam sat alone in his room, he noticed a shimmering stone resting on his windowsill. It reminded him of his wish and the havoc it had caused. Suddenly, he felt a wave of regret washing over him. Determined to make amends, he made another wish upon the stone, to have the ability to speak only the truth. The next day, Adam woke up with a newfound sense of clarity. He went out into the village and sought out each person he had deceived with his lies. With utmost sincerity, he apologized for his dishonesty and expressed his deep regret. They saw the change in Adam and recognized his genuine remorse. From that day forward, Adam became a paragon of honesty and truthfulness in the village. He used his gift of speaking the truth to bring people together, bridge gaps, and to inspire others to be honest in their own lives. He became a beacon of integrity, known far and wide for his lessons in honesty. His story served as a reminder that the path of deceit may seem tempting, but it is the path of truth that ultimately leads to redemption. Unfortunately for Salt Upon Wounds, there was no redemption to be had, as Joshua and I dispatched of him in a fair, though one-sided combat. Heading out of the beautiful lands at our Zion, I sell some gear at Venetron and buy several more implants and chems. Lonesome Road is a perfect test for a high-level character, but I'm still not to the level that I would like, nor is my build perfect with my lower-than-average strength for a melee character. Kims will be able to fill that gap in my resume and get me the job as the ultimate courier. One thing a good courier needs is an iBot, so I make sure to grab the Charismatic Eddie before putting the Lance to good use on numerous sentry bots. While the damage is certainly decent, by far the best part about this particular build is the survivability, and that comes from two main parts. Radchild and the suit of heavy BDSM gear we got from the Enclave. As expected, the weapon fares okay to say the least, but I'm still not fond of its attack pattern. Obviously, the attack speed is phenomenal, but it is certainly not much to look at in terms of animation when compared to a weapon like the Bumper Sword or Super Sludge. In my conversation with Eddie, it's revealed that he completely agrees with me, but that I should kill more things to be sure. With that in mind, I tore my way through the already ravaged land that makes up the Divide. Nothing really stood in my way as I melted my way through enemies like Paula Deen melts through her supply of butter. I do have to use a laser detonator to get through the bombs, but of course I count that as environmental interaction, as it's part of the quest much like the detonator for Laurel's bomber. Besides, anyone who complains about it really reveals their insecurities. I understand not being able to climax effectively, but saying that all men should not find ways to express their own interest in an exciting way isn't very positive. Once in the underpass, Eddie tells me to get back on track, so I tear through more tunnelers that stand on my way before getting to Beast. I'm pretty sure that this guy has never really been an issue, because he somehow managed to always drop his weapon, or fly up into the sky. But this time around I had to take a little while to get through his guard. I blow up another bomb before introducing myself to the local deathclaw population. I mentioned earlier that I wouldn't be able to tank them, and that much is still definitely the case, so I'm sure to utilize some chems and Eddie as a meat shield before sneaking my way up to Bonesaw. Much like Beast, I managed to make him drop his weapon, so I just blasted him all over the back before finishing off his other guys. Sometimes I try not to be explicit and it just comes on me anyway. The tunnelers on the elevator really need some sort of a buff because I always find myself being able to take them down with whatever build I'm running. But as soon as I say that, I'll end up complaining about how difficult they are and need Viagra just to keep up. Instead, I'll talk about how cool the explosives are in the tunnel and how much fun it is to build your own. I'd really like to meet a pyromaniac who feels the same way I do about riding, but with fire. I bet they would be hot. Not as hot as my immense knowledge of Fallout in Vegas because things are about to get interesting. Killing some Cazadors for their glands, buying some jet from Contreras, picking flowers while getting shot at repetitively, killing a few ghouls who tried to take off my head earlier in the run, raiding Repcon test site for Turpentine, and freeing Anders from Cottonwood Cove, we can learn the recipe for Turbo from Diane. This allows me to craft more Turbo to deal with some of the more difficult tunnelers in the cave of the Abaddon. Sure, I could have just reset the vendors to buy chems from Gamora, but like Nurbit, I want to spend as little time there as possible. 
Blowing up some more stuff and kicking it in high gear, I kill the few remaining guys, pump myself full of chems, and start wrapping up this run. Ulysses was unbelievably easy and I didn't get damaged once with the help of Turbo. I can't talk too much shade about him because he really did take me an hour to kill the first time he showed up on my channel during the level 1 fight. But it wasn't long before Eddie sacrificed himself, I stormed my stuff, and began the final battle of Hoover Dam. It may be a complete surprise to you if you managed to fall asleep or have been completely ignoring me while you build your own courier, that the enemies on the dam reacted to my lightsaber butter knife with sudden death, and that it wasn't long before I was penetrating the power armor that the NZR wears to reroute the power and ultimately get to the Legate's camp. Here I had a little bit of trouble with the Praetorians, and when I say I had a little bit of trouble, I managed to take a really small amount of damage. Fortunately, I was able to somehow disarm them over and over again, so it wasn't long before I was at the big evil scary guy himself. He's a bit harder than Ulysses in that he's unbelievably fast even with the effects of Turbo, but he takes about the same amount of beating before ultimately dying. After finishing off his remaining guards, I killed General Oliver, proving that yes, you can beat Fallen to Vegas only using the Thermic Lance. If you enjoyed this video, check out another one here. If this video made you laugh or cry, consider checking out my Patreon using the link to the right here. I've been Al, but do me a favor, will ya? Have a good one.